God bless you. Welcome this wonderful Friday evening. Visitors, friends, neighbours, countrymen, you're welcome. Turn around, just give each other a wave offering and we want to welcome people watching a live stream at home. Praise God, you are welcome. It's another week gone past. Uh, today I had the, it was a sad occasion this morning, I had to travel to Chiswick. Um, I was officiating a funeral service of a young, uh, a young man prematurely passed over to be with the Lord, 47 years old. His name's Angelos and he truly is an Angelos. The word Angelos means angel and he's gone to be with the angels. I prayed for him not too long ago and he passed over. So we want to pray for Helen, for Brenda, for George and all the ch- and his children. We'll just bow our heads, just a few moments of reflection and prayer for them. And, you know, just to remember them in our prayers. Let's just bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your love. I pray for Helen, for Brenda, for the children. I pray as Angelus has passed over, he's in your loving embrace, that we know he's on a journey. He's on the next stage of his journey, a road that we will all pass through, Lord. The inevitable appointment we all have, Lord. But let's pray that we cross over in your love, in your peace, in your joy, Lord, as we give you the praise, the glory, and the worship. We pray for the message on this evening, Lord, that you will speak into our lives And you will encourage us, Lord, and open the veil of obscurity that we'll see you as you reveal yourself to us, Lord, and not diminish you to our level as we give you the praise, the glory, and the worship. In Jesus' name we say amen, 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 and amen. Praise God. God bless you. Tonight's message is on the subject of prayer. You know, uh, the best person to teach us about prayer is Jesus himself. He was a a man of prayer. He was God, divine, but he was also man. He shared divinity and humanity. And in his humanity, he showed us the way how we should behave, how we should be speaking, and how we should respond and not react to life's challenges and situations and circumstances. In fact, um, he encourages us that we need to be people of prayer. Amen. There was a time when the disciples were in Gethsemane. And they were there, they were being challenged. God, the Lord, foresaw what would take place, that he would be betrayed. His betrayer was at hand. And he said to them to pray for one particular specific reason, reason, lest they come into temptation. He asked them to pray lest they come into temptation. If we turn to Matthew chapter 26, verse 40, I want to read a few verses here and just put a context to it. So I pray you're opening the spirit to receive the message from God. Then he came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, what, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Can you stand, stay, stand alongside of me? Sleep, lethargy took, took you over and they were sleeping. And verse 41, he says this, he said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we need to continually pray that we can overcome life's challenges and so forth. And there's a reason the Lord tells him that, because he experienced that himself. You know, at the very beginning, when Jesus was baptized, his ministry began, took off. The foundation of taking off, the catalyst of Jesus' ministry taking off was at the baptism. That's where he revealed God, his father, identified and revealed with his purpose, his mission for his life. But it preceded the revelation of Jesus, who Jesus was, preceded with Jesus praying. And that's in Luke chapter 3, verse 21. I just want to take you on this journey with me to empower us and equip us to overcome whatever distractions and temptations come in our lives. Because whether we like it or not, temptations are a part of life. Distractions are a part of life. When all the people were baptized, so when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized because he wanted to identify with us. He was sinless, he was without sin. And we know that because the the process, what took place there was they'll go to the water, confess their sins, and then get baptized. But Jesus, according to the Gospel of Matthew, he went into the water and immediately came out of the water, meaning, implying that he didn't confess anything. He was sinless. But he wanted to identify with our particular journey. And we're told this. And while he prayed, why would Jesus need to pray? He was God incarnate. Who was praying to himself? No, to his father. Uh, While he prayed, the heavens were opened. Prayer has, has, has has the power to open heaven. Prayer from the heart is the key to open heaven. If you want to be empowered spiritually, pray 
in the spirit because there's three layers three ways we pray physically emotionally and rationally or I should say spiritually much of people's prayer unfortunately even in Christendom is carnal physical it's all about me myself and I but we need to disqualify the unholy trinity and receive the holy trinity father son and holy spirit as long as we're thinking of ourselves and preoccupied ourselves with our with our own gratifying our own sensual desires and our carnality we cannot see beyond the limitations that the world puts around us and so we need to be praying in the spirit so there's a physical prayer which is about self all to do with the selfishness that's why the first thing that has to go to follow jesus is self-ego and then there's an emotional level people pray from a place of emotional past hurts and, and always reflecting the past so their prayer is always connected to the past i wish i'm speaking to someone it's always about him her or the other woe is me and there's a self-pity attitude in emotional prayer but the powerful prayer is a prayer in the spirit that psalm 46 verse 10 tells us be still and no you don't have to just be still enjoy busk in the presence of God he says be still the word still means to surrender surrender to God be still and know that I'm God because once you know he is God she said if you are my disciples you will abide in my word and by and, and you and you will abide in my and the truth you'll know the truth and the truth will met you set you free you know he says be still and know that I am God when you know that he's God everything is resolvable everything finds its level where there's no way there is a way when you know he's God the impossibilities become possibility I wish I'm speaking to someone today amen I will be exalted among the nations I'll be exalted in the earth which earth the earth of our hearts God wants to be exalted in the earth of our hearts but oftentimes we play church we 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 go through the the motions the trappings of church but Christ is not present central to our lives what do I mean by this well if you just need to look at Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 we're told here very clearly he says look he says to the church behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come into him and dine with him and be and he with me hold it a second but you're talking to a church who professes to be Christ to be Christian to to be uh, uh, called by God to be following the ways of Christ there's one thing for Christ to be in you and there's something completely different for Christ to be around you I, I'm going to try and decode this for us and welcome the people watching live stream at home because people think by just coming to church Christ is permit is, is enthroned in our hearts so far from the truth because it's an attitude of the heart an openness in the spirit to receive Christ and give him permission to enter he doesn't force his way into your life he wants permission to enter your life praise God you see Judas one of the close disciples was with Jesus is that not correct yes he was around Jesus yeah we can be around the Bible we can be around the Bible but Satan can be still reigning in our hearts wow the devil knows the Bible better than you and I actually because when he was tempting Jesus he quoted the scriptures but he knows he doesn't know how to how to use the scriptures spiritually he knows how to quote he's got knowledge but no power because knowledge puffs up because he's proud but love edifies come on this Bible study you see Judas was around Jesus but we're told in Luke chapter 22 verse 3 this is what we're told Judas being around Jesus watch this then Satan what is then theo satanas is judan he says and satan entered judas hold it a second but you're you're next to jesus i can't this is sometimes this is a problem people are around they're around the relics they're around holy people but yet satan can say why because you give them there's an opening there oh come on i wish i'm speaking to someone look in john chapter 13 verse 27 watch this it then say it says then after the piece of bread Satan entered him then Jesus said to him what you do do quickly oh Jesus is there Judas is there Satan enters enters Judas and he goes what you do do quickly because he still possesses his free will to decide whether to let Christ enter him or the devil enter. Jesus saying I stand at the door and knock he is hears my voice open and I'll come into him 
or her, whatever the case is, and, we'll, and I'll make my bold, I'll be with him. So who do we want in our lives? We want Jesus in our lives. We want to evict the devil because we shouldn't give him the title deeds of our lives and we must let Christ be established in our lives and reign in us and through us because he inhabits the praises of his people. But when we're preoccupied with worldly things and we're praying in a carnal way, we, we, we detach spiritually from what God wants to do in our lives. And so the Lord told the disciples, pray lest you come into temptation, connect with me. Yeah, connect with me. Be filled, the comforter, let the comforter fill you. Not the satanic ideas, imaginations and influences that are permeating all over the world. Watch this, watch this. So when Jesus told them, the reason he told them because he lived by example. Because Jesus prayed, let me go just back to uh, Luke chapter 3 verse 21. It says this. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened because he's been equipped for the journey ahead. And prayer equips us for our own personal spiritual journey. Come on. Yeah. And then verse 22 says this. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If you want to please God, be a prayerful person. If you want to please God, be a prayerful person. If you want to be commended by God, be a prayerful person. Pray. What is prayer? It's, it's a dialogue between yourself and God. But oftentimes we have a one, one part. We just It's one direction. We need voice and hearing. So we need to pray, but we need to also listen. Be quick to hear and slow to speak. We need sometimes be still and know that it's God, that he needs to speak to life. And why it's important he prayed and the Holy Spirit came upon him. But by chapter 4, watch this. You see, he was preparing him for something lying ahead. Chapter 4, this is what happens in chapter 4. Watch this. Then Jesus, what? Being filled. Judas was filled with Satan. Jesus been filled with the Holy Spirit. He identified with us what was necessary, essential for us for our spiritual journey. And what lets us down and what causes us to fall away and fall apart is because we're not filled with the presence of God. And he returned, he says, filled with the Holy Spirit. He prayed. What proceeded was prayer. The heavens opened, the Holy Spirit descended and lightened upon him as a dove. Yeah, But then we're told by chapter 4 verse 1, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. If Jesus needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit who's pure, righteous, sinless, how much more do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? That's why Jesus says when he ascended the Holy Spirit, he gave gifts unto men. He released the Holy Spirit. He left, the Holy Spirit will come from his Father, sent from his Father into our lives, which is powerful. And returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Because then from then on, your God orders the steps of the righteous person. And he takes him to the path that God wants him to go. We don't carve paths for ourselves. We look to God and he leads us. That's where it says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Implying that you're following him, he's leading you. You're not running, uh, you're, run, you're not second guessing God. You're not running ahead of God. He's leading you, praise God. And he's told that he, he led he, and, and, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So prayer proceeded. The Holy Spirit, heavens open. You want heaven to open, pray. Pray with genuine prayer from the heart. The heavens are open. The Holy Spirit descends as a dove lights upon him. Then he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit leads him to the For what purpose? What reason is he led into the wilderness? The answers are there. Self-evident. Verse 2 tells us this. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, uh, and, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. So he was led in the spirit. And we're told tempted for 40 days by the devil. Now, what was the difference between himself yeah, and Judas? If you, want, if you want to put him on, identify with the human condition, the human journey we're taking, the human plight, the difference is filled with the Holy Spirit in order to contend and to have an advantage over demonic temptation. And being hungry, says he was hungry. And, and then verse 2, verse 3, the devil uses that, if you like, this need, if you like, okay, situation. And they would say to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. He said to him, so he used that kind of need, uh, Jesus' disposition of hunger 
to try and entice him to 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 uh, somehow take advantage over him to expose to expose something of Jesus' identity, trying to find a weakness in Jesus. He said, "As a command, this stone to become bread." It's interesting because one and for people not aware of this, one of the titles of Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. But one another title of Jesus is bread. He's the bread of life. Artos, ego imo, o artos de zois. I am the bread of life. He says, takes this litho, which is the stone that the builders rejected, and make it into bread. Hold it a second, Satan. I'm ahead of you. This stone has already become the bread. I am the bread of life. He's ahead, always ahead. God is always a step ahead of, or billion, trillion steps ahead of all of us. When we think we got there, we haven't even began. Come on. So he's already had done this. And Jesus responded to him and said to him this, verse 4. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now you see the thing is this, is the fact that what precedes prayer, because Jesus' life was characterized by prayer. He prayed. When you pray, God will give you the wisdom to be able to respond and overcome every challenge in life. It's through prayer. You know, often we pray, you know, we have, we have adversity around our lives, we have difficulty around our lives, we even have difficult people around our lives. And we often pray to God, deal with them. Do. No, God's not going to deal with them. God's going to deal with you how you handle them. <laughs> he says, you pray for those, your enemies, you know, the accusers, those who persecute. You just pray for them. You don't, you know, I'm not going to change them, but I'm going to help them change you and make you a better person for it. And they're going to become the stepping stone to get you closer to the destiny that I have for you. So you may not change them, but we change. When we pray, things, objective things don't change. Subjectively, we change in ourselves. We become a more meek, more humble person, more appreciated person. We should be. And that's what adversity creates in us, humility. And humility is the order of the day. Humility overcomes demonic pride and arrogance and conceitedness. Humility is the order of the day. It was God, Jesus, God, the words, humility, that he became man and washed the disciples' feet. The creator was serving the creation. And that's love. That's pure, pure love. Praise God. And then verse next verse. I'm, actually, it's not my message for tonight. I want to come back to prayer. But just let's follow this to a natural conclusion. The devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And verse 6. And the devil said to him, all this authority I give, I give you and their glory. For this, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whoever I wish. Again, pride lifts man on a high uh, mountain of pride and so forth. In verse 7, this is, therefore, if you worship before me, all, of, all be, will be yours. How can you give me something that I already have? You get it when you get home. In the same way he said to Eve, if you, you, know, if you take off this fruit, you'll become like God. Hold on, hold on a second. Uh, Genesis 1, 26, 27. Let us make man in our image and our, according to our likeness. Uh, but I'm that... You're giving me what I already have. And that's what he's giving to Jesus, already he has. Uh, Psalm 24 verse 1 says this. Quick, let's just quickly go over, I'll cross-reference. Very, so Psalm 24 verse 1, very on the overhead, very quickly. Can we get there? Uh, the earth is the... And all its... And the world and all those who... You're giving me something that belongs to me. The devil is a liar. He's an he's a murderer. And that's what he was from the beginning. Praise God. And that's why Judas could not but betray Jesus. Because when Sensor enter, entered him, he was in the driving seat of Judas' life. Because the devil entered. And we've got to be careful. Don't think because you stand next to the Bible you're holy. Don't think because you come to church we're holy. It's a, a way of life that changes everything. It's our commitment, our, our surrendering to God that makes the difference. That's why Jesus said to the disciples, pray, be watch and pray, lest you come into temptation. We need to prepare for people, praise God. You see, even Simon Bar-Jonah, who later was called Peter, the rock, there's a difference between the lithos and Petra. He was a Petros. Stability, the rock. 
on this, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. But it came, uh, uh, there was, there, somehow there was a relapse, there was a backsliding of, 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 of Peter, he came back to Simon by Jonah. And there was an instance where before Jesus would be betrayed, he said, Jesus said to him, Satan, he said to him. In fact, let me just quote chapter 22, Luke 22, verse 21. It's interesting here because, um, you know, Satan wanted permission. He said, behold, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 22, verse uh, 31, sorry. No, it's 21, sorry, 21. No, it's 31, yeah. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Hold a second. Can you imagine what Satan, Satan has no right, no authority over anyone, but he has to try and get the permission, consent. And the only way, the only, the thing is that for the devil to attack us, there's a, there's a, there's a reason behind it, not to destroy us. But there's a, there's, a, there's a mystery, a mechanism in that to help us grow and develop that we're ignorant of because we don't have the relationship with God. We're not that connected. It says, and the Lord said, that, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But watch what Jesus says. He says, but I have prayed for you. See, when we cannot pray, he stands in the gut for us and prays for us. He, says, I, he, said, he said, I've prayed for you, he said. And, and then he goes on to say that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Because he foreknew, he knew that Peter would deny him three times. So Simon would deny him three times. He said, I've been praying, I've prayed for you. And when you return, he says, strengthen your brethren. Praise God. But interestingly, the Lord prayed for him and he did go through his journey, through his adversity, through his struggle to the point of denying the Lord three times. But then the Lord restores him at the shore of his life when he asked him three times to counsel out the denials, Simon by Jonah, do you love me more than this? And he didn't use the new name, he used the old name, the old man. But when you return to the Peter mentality and come out the old way of thinking, then you'll strengthen your brethren and you'll be overcome and you will be that rock. That the church of God is, is what the, when we speak the, say the rock, we're talking about the faith part element of it. And the church of oh, God will be built and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So we need to, when God does a new work in us, anyone in Christ is a new creation, everything old has passed away, you've got to celebrate your newness and st stop being connected to the oldness. Because if you're praying emotionally, all you're going back to the old man. When you pray in the spirit, you stand and you accept and you celebrate the new thing that God is doing in your life. Amen. Hallelujah, praise God. And Jesus did not only pray for Simon by Jonah. The same prayer he lifted up was for you and for me. You want me to qualify this? I'll qualify this very quickly. John chapter 17. Let's go to verse 14. I want to read a few verses here just to put a context to it before we move in. Tonight's message is about prayer, to encourage you to pray more and more and more. You may not see any physical evidence, any physical outcome immediately of that prayer. Just lift it to God. There's power in the word, in prayer. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You know, don't, don't be surprised if people don't like you for no reason. The psalmist says they hated me without a cause. They don't know why they hate me, but just don't like me. Because our rhythms are different. They're the discord with the rhythm. When you vibrate with someone who has the same frequency as you, there's a harmony. When you vibrate with someone who's got a different uh, 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 resonance than you, your vibration, there's a conflict. The, the ones in music know what I'm talking about. If you have a chord, it's the first, third, uh, uh, the first, third and fifth of, of the scale that makes the chord. If you put another chord that doesn't harmonize, it'll be a discord and it'll be, it'll be, it'll be uncomfortable. It won't be harmonious. It'll be out of tune. And if somebody's out of tune with God, they'll be out of tune with you. You get that when you get home. Get, let me say that again. If someone's out of tune with God and you're in tune with God, the vibration of theirs and your vibration will conflict. They'll be uncomfortable around you or you'll be uncomfortable around them. It won't be harmonious. It won't be, the, you, 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 it'll be unpleasant to your hearing, to your, your emotions, your feelings. So it says, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
your heavenly citizens, if you see to the right hand of God the Father in Christ Jesus. In verse 15, watch this. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. Wow. Keep them from the, that he doesn't take control of the reins of their lives. That they, Christ wants to be enthroned in us. Hallelujah. Please, when you go back home, reflect over the message and absorb it, take it in and apply it into your lives. Just don't just hear words. Go back and reflect. Do your spiritual exercise as well as your physical exercise. It will, it will, it will serve you well in the long term, your eternity, praise God. I've just buried a young man, 47 years old. No one would have known that would have happened today. This young man a year ago did not foresee that that would be the last year of his life. No one knows when the next one will bring. Last week I did this funeral service for my mother. She was 90 years old. She lived a good course in life. We always, even if they live 150, we still think they've gone too soon. Yeah? It doesn't matter because of the, 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 the disconnection, the, the, you know, the, that passing over, is, is, it brings emotions about ourselves as well, how we feel about life. It reminds us of our mortality that we're passing through. Yeah? So, so, but God wants to cover us to protect us from evil. And then verse 16 said this, watch this. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Yeah? And then he says this, this is the vibration, you see, it's a vibration, heavenly uh, scales, if you like, uh, frequencies. And verse next verse says, sanctify them by your truth, for your word is truth. The more we're absorbed in truth, we become sanctified, consecrated, and God's holiness will permeate us, praise God. Watch this, verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent, I have sent them into the world. God wants us here to change, to retune the world to change its vibration and verse next verse and for their sake I sanctify I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth verse I do not watch this I do not pray for these alone that the ones around him immediately around him watch this I do not pray for those immediately around me but also for those who will believe in me through their word who implies you. If you believe in him through the word of the apostolic teaching and ministry, he, your, that prayer covers you on this day. Amen. You are covered by the prayer of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. And if you have a, a, a lapse in your vision, in your step, in your, in your progression, always come back, gravitate, gravitate back to him. And his prayer is sufficient, suffices to cover you, praise God, to bless you. Oh, it is powerful. It's really encouraging. It's empowering. Let's go to the next verse very quickly. It says this, that they all may be one as you, Father, I am me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So there's unity, the love, permits, and prayer creates this climate of unity. Prayer breaks down strongholds. Hallelujah. Prayer transcends the limitations, distractions of the world. Prayer is, pow is a powerful tool. Hallelujah. That we need, to, we need to apply. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's different levels of prayer, different, different postures of prayer. There's a prayer where you lift your hands up in the sky. There's a prayer that you kneel. There's a prayer that you hold hands. But the powerful prayer of humility is the prostration on the floor where you abase yourself which is called proskinesis, which is right, putting your flat face to the floor and say, I surrender, Lord. I surrender all to you. It's no longer I, but you. It says, I must decrease that he must increase, praise God. When Abraham met the Lord in, in, in Genesis chapter 18, he prostrated on the floor. He said, you are greater than I. Hallelujah. It's powerful, powerful, powerful. So prayer does amazing things. And I want to show you some examples of what prayer can do if you allow me for the next few moments. Praise God. Would you allow me? Yes. Praise God. Let's go to um, Luke. Oh, let me just go to Luke chapter 9, verse 28. So we saw that prayer opens the heavens. You want to change your disposition, your, 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 your person, your, everything about you. Prayer is the key. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings. Have you come to your eighth day? The number eight speaks of spirituality. Because we look, we, we the, 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 the world was created in six days and seventh day the Lord rested. And, and so, so six days God created the, the heavens and earth and full man on the sixth day. On the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, he rested. And then it starts the first day of the Jewish, of the, or Jewish week, which is our Sunday, which is the first day of the Jewish week. 
Now, Christ stepped out the tomb on the first day of the Jewish week. We see through historical patristics in the early church see that day that the Lord rose as a new created day. So they added, they extended the seven days to make it an eighth day. And the eighth day speaks of spirituality, the perpetual day. This is the day the Lord has made that we'll rejoice and we'll be glad in it. Praise God. And we are the eighth day people. Because the eighth day speaks of spirituality, sixth day speaks of carnality, seventh day speaks of rest, and eighth day speaks of God completing the work of creation in the spiritual realm. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Hallelujah. So it says, and now it came to pass about eight days after these saints that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Wow. Because that was his custom. He was a prayer. He prayed. Now we want to be Christ-like. If we want to be Christ-like, we've got to be prayerful people, praying people. Hallelujah. Praying people. But not praying and making a spectacle of ourselves. It's good to pray in the church. But there's a t- Paul says pray without ceasing. I mean our whole life's life must reflect prayer. The way we walk, the way we talk, the way we listen, the way we act, the way we behave must reflect the prayer of God. That connection with God, the love of God. Hallelujah. Which is powerful, empowering. Praise the Lord. He says he went up on the mountain to pray. Watch this. Verse 29. As he prayed, now who prayed? Jesus. Again, the disciples all around him. Okay. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistened. Prayer changed his countenance, how he looked. If you want to change, pray. Hallelujah. There'll be a glow, a radiance in you, around you, and upon you. When Moses went to the Mount Sinai and he came before the presence of God, when he went down the mountain, his face was radiating with the Shekinah glory, reflection of the Shekinah glory of God, that he had to pull a veil of his face. Because the the Israelites could not look upon that glory, that that anointing that he had upon him. I wish I am I speaking? Am I speaking to people watching live stream? Things change in prayer. Things change, you praise God. You know, and, and things happen that you can't... You can't even account for. Doors open that you can never imagine they can open. And other doors close that you're not supposed to go through them. God will close them for you. But doors will open that no one can close Amen. when you're a prayerful person. A person who surrenders to God. And then as, it, as this, this, all this is unfolding before the eyes, watch this verse 30. It says this, watch, watch. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, verse 31, who appeared in in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. And sometimes the translations do not do the original Greek justice. See, speak of his decease. It implies that he dies. Disease represents death. But they were not talking about his decease. The Greek word here is exodon. They were talking about his exodus, like leaving Egypt, the exodus of leaving, of leaving the Egypt of this world. They were speaking about his exodus because no one truly dies in God. We sleep, we just exit, go from this location to a different location. We migrate somewhere else. We don't die, we always live somewhere in the presence of God or far away from God, but we never stop existing. In reality, there's no thing such death is a condition, an attitude of the mind, a separation. But we always live somewhere. Jesus said, God is not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. So I know that Angelos today, he's more alive than he's ever been in being here. I know that my mother is more alive, more than she's ever been here. I've got no doubts about that and I rejoice in that. Hallelujah. We have the hope of the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, our preaching is in vain, as Paul says. It's hopeless. We're to be pitied of all people. But we're not because we know there's a resurrection. We know we have a body, soul, and spirit. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. I wish some. Hallelujah. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 32, talking about prayer, when you come uh, to pl- challenges and you know that God has got your back. Be still and know you, you're God, that he's God. The thing is, in the Old Testament, when the Israelites were going to war, it was God who fought the battle for them. Yeah? He says, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we've got to take God at his word. You know, when we've got to challenge the Lord, 
you guide me. You take over. Take over the whole situation. Because without you, I can do nothing. In, in, in John chapter 15, verse 5, it says this. Watch, this is a very important verse that we need to absorb. And we need to internalize this. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So why are we trying to do things without Christ? It, it, it's, it's crazy. We've got to do it in him and through him and him in us and through us, praise God, will change his everything. Hallelujah. And going back to Luke chapter 22, verse 41, when Jesus came to Gethsemane, he says, uh, he came to Gethsemane and he was about to pray. He knew that the betrayers were at hand, the betrayer was at hand, and he knew he was going to be handed over to the Roman authorities. And it, it was unfolding before everyone what was taking place. They would be falsely accused and ultimately be sentenced, punished, death through crucifixion. And when he's in this guy, then he's praying, want to come to terms as a natural, because God does not, death for the natural man, for Christ, humanity was not normal. Psychologically, without sin, you cannot understand death, because you can't die. Sin, the wage of sin is death. Jesus was sinless, so he really couldn't really die. He had to do some, he had to facilitate something to die. And what he had to do, what he took, he took the sins of ourselves upon him on the cross of Calvary. And it's through they that facilitated his death. There were borrowed sins upon him that he could be taken into Hades. And it's a different story for a different time, a different message. And he told, and he was, and he was withdrawn from them about stones, away from the Peter, John, and James. And he knelt down and prayed. Again, we keep having this repetition of Jesus praying. So if it's important for the master, it's got to be important for you and for me. Yeah? It's got to be important. It must be very part of our makeup, our spiritual makeup. And verse 42 says this. Saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Interesting, Christ, the Son of God, the Word of God incarnate, is come to a place in his journey that he's trying to come to terms with what's about to unfold before his very eyes. And he asked the Father, said, if it's possible, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. But he concedes to the will of the Father. And sometimes there'll come in times in your life and my life that there's challenges lying ahead or obstacles or situations that we find difficult to understand in the natural. And we've got to concede and give them to God and say, not my will, thou will done. If, if God's not taking them away, say, Lord, what is the lesson I'm learning from this adversity? What is the lesson I'm learning from this challenge? Because there's got to be a lesson. For God to allow you to go through it and in it, there has to be a lesson involved, connected to what we are going through. Hallelujah, praise God. That's why David said, ye though walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He was taken, ye though walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. He even knew when he was in the dark place, he knew God was with him. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So in the place of adversity, the place of challenge, the place of my struggle, I know you are going to comfort me because you have received, released the comfort of the Holy Spirit to help me through my plight, through my challenge. Hallelujah. He said, he says, but not my will, your, but yours be done. He says, ultimately, Lord, you just, whatever your will is for my life. But you know what the Lord does as a result of this prayer? Next, next 42, verse 43, that the Father does. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Observe, the Lord didn't take the, the problem away, but he sent someone there to help him through the problem. And let me tell the people watching live stream, you may be going through a problem. Maybe God has a helpmate for you, someone to intervene in that, to help you, strengthen you, to get through that challenge, that problem. Because where there is a crucifixion, let me tell you, there's going to be a resurrection. Amen. There will be an overcoming. Wherever there's a crucifixion, you will overcome. There is a resurrection. Because the cross is not the end of the story. It's just a signpost pointing to something better. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. This is it's powerful narratives. These are powerful narratives in relation to the word of God. So when we have struggles, we know that he will help us through every single one if we trust him. Praise God. So whatever you're going through today in your lives, I want to encourage you. Be a prayerful people. Be encouraged. 
Because when God begins something, he's more than able to bring it to fruition, to complete the work he started in you. All you've got to do is just connect with him, vibrate, let his vibration of his presence of his spirit be in you, fill you, and empower you. And whatever obstacle lies ahead, you will, tr- you will transcend, you will overcome it at God's, in God's time and in God's way if we trust God. And stop trying to do it our way. Because without him, we can do nothing. God is pure love. He wants your best. He's got your best intentions at heart, praise God. And when you have difficult times, say, what is the lesson I'm learning from these difficult times? What lesson are you teaching me? Amen. Let's bow our heads and let's stand together and ask to praise him and bow our heads. We ask the Lord to make sense of the message this evening. That if he's standing at the door and knocking, we are opening. We are saying, come in. We want his peace that surpasses understanding. Hallelujah, praise God. Hallelujah, praise God. Father, we thank you for your love. I pray for everyone at the end of my voice that the word has gone forth will execute that which it's sent out to do and not return void. I pray that we'll be prayerful people, Lord, that we'll be open to your leading, to your comfort, to your counsel, to your wisdom, and we seek you and we will have an experience as we have never had before. Hallelujah, as we give you the praise, the glory, and the preeminence, as we say resounding amen in, amen in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, as we give you the praise and the glory. Hallelujah. I'm just going to hand back to the praise team just to lift up.